Give me just a moment here as it gets set up. <clears throat> so this year we're going to do something a little different. We figured uh, some of the members have come together and decided that uh, it would be a good thing to have a church giving uh, potluck. Uh, so we're going to do it on Sunday, uh, November 26th, so the Sunday after um, Sunday after uh, Thanksgiving. You guys are already going to be here anyway, so you might as well show up. <laughs> uh, but it's immediately following the service uh, if you are attending we do ask that you sign up there's a sign up sheet in the back uh, just say you know uh, who you are and how many are going to be with you in your party definitely uh, bring guests uh, people that that may have missed out on thanksgiving or don't have family to, to to share that time with definitely invite them to come out um there's also going to be a sheet for for certain dishes there too like turkey dressing uh, mashed potatoes, all that kind of stuff. And if there's anything extra that's not on the list that you want to bring, just we just ask you um, just add whatever dish you're going to bring. Uh, just put it on there. Um, you're not required to bring anything, but we do ask that if you're able to, please do. Um, and please just come. It says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. In Psalms 133 and 1. Uh, so we just want to have that opportunity to come together as a family, as a church family. Uh, so, again, everyone's invited. Please sign up just so that we can uh, not have 50 turkeys here and <laughs> everyone just bring the napkins or whatever it is. All right. So just keep uh, Pastor in prayer uh, uh, this morning. Uh, he wasn't feeling well, so um, he wasn't able to come this morning. And like I said, my wife uh, is traveling. She's going to be leaving today around 2, so she's going to get in late. So pray for safe travels. And then yesterday, uh, my son Seth, usually he's here with me, but uh, he actually had a seizure yesterday. Uh, so just keep him in prayer. He's resting with his grandfather today um, at their house. Uh, so just keep him in prayer as well. All right, I'm going to get into it. So a couple of weeks ago, nasty, rainy day. Um, and someone had mentioned, like, oh, it's really gross outside. And so I, w the Lord just started to deal with me, and I was thinking about the rain. And actually, the rain is a beautiful thing. Um, and so with the rain, uh, I was going to talk about God's purposes with the rain and how he interacts with his people and, and the nation of Israel with rain. And as I was getting that prepped for that sermon, I just kept hitting roadblocks and I couldn't figure out why. I'm like, why am I having such a hard time? I know what I want to talk about. I know, I know what I want to say. And I just couldn't, for whatever reason, I couldn't put it on paper. And so I just started thinking and I was on the way to work uh, last Monday and I started praying about this service and about, about the church in general. And God spoke to me. I feel like God spoke to me. He said, there's someone, at least one person that's going to show up that day or today, that has been dealing with life, that you've been struggling, you've been contemplating things, <coughs> life has just been hitting you hard this last couple of weeks, and you're not really sure why you have to deal with these situations, you're not really sure why you have to go through them, God, I'm trying to serve you, oh, God, I'm trying to seek you out, but yet, for whatever reason, I'm still struggling, and he said, I want you to share your life story, so most of you when I preach, I, I do use a lot of life situations uh, to, to preach. And so most of you may have heard what I'm going to speak about this morning. But God wants me to bring it all together and, 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 and deliver it as one message. And what I want, my title of my message this morning is, Why Me? God, why me? So when I was younger, as a teenager in high school, I became, my dad was in the military. Uh, he just retired. He, he, he was able to find a, a, a job working out of state. Um, and my brother was in college. And so at, at the house, it was just me and my mom. And, and I, as, as a child, I didn't really, we, I grew up for the most part in a Christian home, but I didn't really have too much of a desire to live for God. I wanted to do my own thing and, and didn't really care too much about it all, at, really at all. But when my dad was gone during the week, for, for whatever reason, I started getting hungry for God again, and I started to get a true hunger for Him, and I, I was really starting to seek Him. And the Bible says in James 4, 8, it says, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts. Uh, don't be double-minded. And so I was just trying to, I was just 
starting to, to seek after him and, and longing for him. And I noticed that God started pulling me in and I, start, and I started feeling his presence in a, a, just a little bit more. And I felt like him leading me in certain directions. And, and ne- that's never really happened before in, in me. And the Bible says in John 6 and 44, it says, No man can come to me except through the Father, which has sent me to draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. And so, so God... Is drawing people. If you show hungerness, God's going to draw unto you. He says, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh unto you. And we can't come to the Father without him drawing us to him. And so as I was going to uh, school in high school then, a uh, classmate saw my hunger and he asked me about baptism. He said, what do you believe about baptism? I was like, oh, well, you, Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, you get baptized in those, in those things. And, and he said, well, you know, and, and uh, I told him, like, it's just profession of faith. It's just to show people that you, you, that you love God. And he said, well, can you show me that in the Bible? Can, can you show me where that says that in the Bible? And I said, oh, yeah, sure I can. And I started looking and researching, and it took me a couple of days or whatever. And I was like, yeah, man, you know, I, I, I can't find it. He's like, well, let me show you this. And he showed me Acts 2.38. And the Bible says, then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then so I just, I've never seen that verse before. I've never, no one's ever mentioned it to me ever in my life. And I said, wow, there's something new about the Word of God for me. And, and I got hooked. I, immediately I got extremely hungry. And I said, there's more to this, to this God than I, than I ever really know. And I, um, so I just began to really seek God uh, at that point. <clears throat> and in Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not my presence only, but which more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both will and to do his good pleasure. So the Bible says you got to work out your own salvation. See, for so many years, for, for my entire childhood, I'd always depended on my dad's <coughs> A, a walk with God. I always depended on what he knew and his knowledge of the word and, and what, what he and his experiences with his walk with God. I never truly had my own, but the Bible says you got to work out your own salvation. You got to find this for yourself. You got to seek it for yourself. The Bible says to, uh, to study and to show yourself approved. So I had to begin to do the work for myself. I can't depend on on my dad's relationship. I can't depend on my grandmother's relationship. I got to have my own relationship with Christ. And that's what I begin to desire. And that's what I begin to long for. And God began to show me and brought me deeper and deeper uh, into, into what God uh, wanted for me in my life. So a few months of seeking God for myself, I was baptized in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And I was filled with the spirit. Uh, with my dad being gone, uh, so my mom, I know I don't look Asian, but I'm half Asian. Um, I'm half Thai, and uh, my mom is a Buddhist. Uh, so she quickly picked up on the change in my life. Uh, she was never really involved with my spiritual well-being. She pretty much stayed on the sidelines. Uh, but she began to notice a difference about my life. She began to notice a change in me. And I wasn't, I never, I've never been the type to go preach at people and, hey, you know, you need to do this and you need to do that. You know, I'm talking about on the outside of, of here. I, I, you know, I try to live my life. I try to be an example, but I don't go and say, hey, you need to, I, you know, I won't do that. Um, I'm going to be the example. If you have questions, I'll talk with you. I'll always pray with you. I will do those type of things, but I'm not going to pre- preach at you. So my mom, because of, because of her spiritual background, she didn't really know too much about what was going on, but she did notice the difference, and she wasn't happy about it. So also at this time, I was working with my mom. She was a chef at a restaurant, and I was a busboy at the front of the house. And they always said, it's never good to work with your relatives. Yeah. And I was really, I, was, I found out real quick why. Um, but because of the new drastic change that occurred in my life, for whatever reason, it rubbed my mom the wrong way. And I personally think it had something to do with the spiritual background of, of, of uh, you know, Buddhism and, and, and uh, God and everything. Uh, I never, like I said, I never really preached at her and that kind of stuff, but she did notice the difference. She began, for whatever reason, she began to berate me in front of the whole staff 
the, at the restaurant. She would say, you know, you're not my son. You're not my effing son. I hate you. Who are you? Why, why would you change your life like this? Like, you know, who is this God that you're talking about? She's like, you know, you, oh, you give money to the church. Well, if you give money to the church, go live at the church. Don't live with me. And she, um, I would come home uh, at night from, from work or from, from school and stuff. And she was like, you know, why don't you take all your clothes? She was like, I'll take all your clothes and I'll throw it out on the lawn. I just remember her just being just terrible. And I was like, God, what's going on? I was like, I thought I was doing a good thing by by seeking you, by wanting to live for you. And I said, what's all this stuff happening? And I began to question. I said, God, why me? And so we would ride. And, and unfortunately, in that situation, we, we, we drove to work together on the weekends. Um, and so I had to listen to her nag and berate me for a half hour, 45 minute ride to work, uh, you know, every time we went in. And it was just, it was tough. It, it was it was very discouraging, you know, because your own mother, you felt like you're being rejected by your own, by your own parents. And, um, it, you know, I wasn't going out doing drugs. I wasn't going out partying. I wasn't going out doing bad things. I was trying to live a life with Christ. I was trying to do good. And yet I was getting so much pushback and I was getting attacked and I, and I didn't understand it. In Matthew 5, 43 and 44, it says, You have heard that it has been said that thou shalt love your neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, blessed be them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that, despite, that, that despitefully use you and persecute you. So as this was going on with, with my mom and, and all this, uh, I started praying. I said, God, I don't understand what's the issue why does she hate me so much? I'm just, all I'm trying to do is do good and I'm trying to live right for you. He said, why am I having to deal with all this? And um, he spoke, I felt like he spoke to me. He said, Willie, whenever she yells and screams at you and she swears at you and berates you in front of everybody, he said, turn to her and look at her and say, mom, I love you. And, uh, and, and I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that. I said, <laughs> I said See, yeah, because like right now, because like, yeah, because like right now, Lord, I, I don't, I'm not feeling it. Like, you know, there's no reason why she's got to be acting like this. And I, to be honest with you, I don't know if I do. I don't know if I do love her. But um, so, yeah, I didn't listen at first. Uh, but I remember one day we were in the house and we were getting ready for work. And for whatever reason, she flipped out again, saying all this stuff about the church and and just going nuts and, and just really screaming at me. And I said, well, God, I guess, I guess I'll try it. And so I, I looked at her. I said, Mom, I said, I know you're angry. I know you're upset. you're upset. I said, but I love you. And she just stopped. She just stopped. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, wow. I was like, wow, okay. And um, yeah. So she, she looked at me and, and she just walked away. Like, you know, no, no sorry, no apology, none of that. She just stopped and she walked away, but it stopped. Um, and over time, every time she would do this, I said, Mom, I love you. And every time I'd say it, it'd stop her dead in her tracks. Um, and, but, but over time, um, our relationship began to, to mend. And he, so before that, uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but uh, probably a few months before all this happened, <laughs> I remember sitting on the, the table with her. I'm, not, I'm exposing myself a little bit now, so. But, I, because this is real. We all have struggles, we all go through things, and I just want you to know that there's hope. So we were sitting at the table, the kitchen table, and she, with the Thai culture, the, the, the youngest was always a failure. She called me the black sheep. She's like, you're gonna be the black sheep of the family. You're never gonna amount to do anything in life. You're always going to fail at whatever you do. He said, just accept the fact that you're never going to do anything. and You're going to be a failure your whole life. So that, that felt good. <laughs> that felt really good. I'm like, okay. I'm like, all right. And so that's why it was so hard for me to say, Mom, I love you. But so just fast forward a little bit in this situation. Um, she went to go visit me in school and college. And um, and when we came back to Virginia, uh, I moved back because my, my dad's health wasn't doing well with my wife and, and the kids. 
And um, she said, she looked at me, she said, my, wife, my mom never, ever apologized. She would never do it. And she looked at me, she's like, out of all my kids, I would have never thought you would be the one to come back and help us and to take care of us. He said, because of the way that I treated you and the way that I was destroying you and, and, that, and that type of thing. She's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, but thank you so much for coming and helping us. But that's the power of God's love. It wasn't me. It was the power of God's love. And so it actually, to be honest, right now she lives with us in Virginia. You know, she lives in my house in Virginia, but she's been living with us for a while. Now, of course, we have our moments, but, um, but it's way better than what it was. Um, and sometimes we get, like I said, when, when we're trying to do good for God and we're trying to do the right thing, and we get these moments and these situations that we get put in, we, God, why? Why, God? Why? All right, so the next part of my, my walk, um, it says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and, direct, and he will direct your path. Be not wise in thine own eyes, for the fear of the Lord and depart from evil. So for the next few years, I was attending uh, an apostolic church uh, down there, and I began to feel the pull of God on my heart to be more involved in ministry. And I really didn't have a direction of what I wanted to do professionally. I always thought I was going to go into the military because my dad was in the Air Force. And so I just that was just kind of like an automatic plan for me that I was just going to do that. I even talked to a few recruiters, but every time that I went to go take the next steps of going into the military, God would tell me no. I was enrolled in a community college at the time. I uh, still really didn't have any idea what I wanted to do. And I remember one day I got home, and I was just so frustrated. And I began to pray. And I said, God, I really need direction. I, I, I don't know. It's like, obviously, you don't want me to go in the military. I have no idea what I want to do. You know, I'm not going to be working at the restaurant my whole life. So I, so I was like, I, I need something. Please, God, just speak to me. Tell me what to do. And I remember this day very vividly. I, I saw... A backdrop of a city in my head and I saw big bold letters uh, it says I want you to go to Bible College in St. Louis and I was like hmm okay and so I thought you know because I had a desire a little bit to go to Bible College anyway so I thought maybe it was just me and I said well God if this is really you then I need confirmation so about a week later I got a thing in the mail I got an application from Gateway Bible College of Evangelism and I'm like, huh, that's weird. And the date that was on the, the paper or, or the application was the date that I prayed. So I, to me, I felt like, okay, well, I, I'm pretty sure this is confirmation. So <laughs> I talked to my pastor. He wasn't all too enthused about it. But uh, he's like, you know, if this is what you feel and then this is what God's leading you to, then, then you, you have my blessing. Uh, so uh, a couple, but so the, the funny thing is it didn't happen right away. Like, I, it was another two years before I even went. So it was an, uh, I got it in, the, I think, 95, 96. I think I didn't go until 98. So, yeah, so 98 is when I went. Um, so for two years, I had to sit on this. And there was moments I went back to the Army recruiter again because I'm like, well, it doesn't seem like, God, it doesn't seem like you're coming through. It's like, you're not, this ain't happening, so I guess I'm going to have to make up my own plans. So I went back to the Army recruiter and tried to go back in there. And I was both, I was, scheduled to do an ASVAB test on a Monday and that Sunday before a, a local pastor came and preached at our church and he said the test of the rose he preached about the rose and about a woman that was going to be at a train station and meeting a guy he said I'll be the one holding the rose and it was a test and it was a lady that was that, that wasn't very attractive but they were talking for years and, and um, he said, it's a test. And, and, he, and God spoke to me that night. He said, this whole thing was a test. He's like, I don't want you to go. He said, I'm going to open up the doors for you to go to Bible college, but you've got to be willing to, to have faith and, and step forward. And so from then, I, I ended up going to Bible college. So my second year of Bible college, I met the most beautiful and amazing woman I have ever met. Uh, so, and, and it, it, you know, my wife, Jessica. Uh, over time, we became great friends, and we actually got very close, and, and I began to fall for her. And the Bible says in Proverbs 18 and 22, all you men, whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtained favor of the Lord. 
Well, I found a great thing. And for 22 years, we've been married for 22 years. So uh, it's, it's been a blessing. My wife is an amazing woman. Um, so before I bought, uh, left the a Bible college, the Lord, uh, I, was at, I was at a chapel service uh, one day, and I began to pray. And he spoke to me that day, and he said, he said Willie, things are going to get difficult the next little while. And I didn't really know what he meant. He said, but I want you to tr- have faith in me and trust in me that I'm going to take care of everything. So right after that, maybe two or three weeks after that, I started having seizures. I started having seizures at, at the services, at church, at work, uh, at the dorm. And so I, had, I got to the point where I had to quit my job where I was there. And um, I wasn't able, because it was a private college, you pretty much had to fund your own tuition. Uh, so because of me not being able to work, I had to step away from, from college. Uh, but Jessica's family was so kind and invited me into their home. Uh, even though I was having seizures on the regular and I had unsteady work, I wasn't able to work too much. Um, going through all these issues. I was having seizures quite a bit at the time. But yet, my wife stood by my side before we were married. She knew all my medical history. Uh, I, ha- I have a disease called uh, tuber sclerosis called TS, where your body develops tumors. Uh, I have them in the brain. Uh, and, and Usually, you, you are, uh, you're acceptable, acceptable to uh, epilepsy. Uh, so, I, you know, I've struggled with that over the years. And because of all this, my wife still stood by my side and she still said yes. So I'm forever grateful for her because she could have easily have said no. But at the same time, I knew she was pulled in by my undeniable good looks. So, so, <laughs> so again, I asked, I said, God, why me? Why me? So after being married for a couple of years, Jessica became pregnant with Seth. Uh, we were always told that we were always going to have issues with kids because of the disease that I have um, and that there are always going to be seizures and what have you. Uh, so there was a 50-50 chance each kid that we have that they would get this disease. And unfortunately, Seth was a lucky one. Uh, one night while she was pregnant with Seth, now I am going to talk about some supernatural things. I don't know where you guys, some of you feel on that, but I know this happened. Um, cause it was, uh, so anyways, I was asleep one night and we were in the apartment and I heard a bunch of noise in the apartment and I was in like that half sleep, the half sleep mode. You know how you get like half asleep, half awake, you think, or you're sleeping, but you think you're awake. And I saw, or I heard a bunch of commotion in the house and I thought someone broke into the house. But then I saw a shadow come across the the apartment and I I saw it come up and it actually sat up on my wife while she was pregnant and it was sitting there and I heard it speaking it was saying something and I couldn't understand what it was saying and then I looked over and it looked over at me and I saw these red eyes and it was and and then I just you know I was kind of like what in the world and so I just began the only thing I knew what to do was speak the name of Jesus so in my mind I just began to speak his name and I spoke it, and then immediately, the, the whatever it was, disappeared and went away. Um, that being said, Seth was diagnosed with TS at birth, um, so he has tumors on his brain, his heart, his kidneys, and his eyes. He has two tumors in the middle of his brain to where it blocks brain fluid, um, and if it if it grows too much, it could possibly kill him. Um, he also has autism, and then he has epilepsy as well. And you guys, you guys have seen him here a few times. Um, so, but uh, when, he, when he, he came home with the heart monitor the first few weeks of his life. So the next two years for us was a nightmare. Because after, right about when he turned one years old, uh, he began to have seizures. And um, his head would turn to the left. He would vomit. His whole body would turn purple and blue. He felt lifeless, uh, and this would happen about every two months, and he would be hospitalized every single time, a few days at a time. Uh, one of those times, I was working at, at a group home at night, and my wife was sleeping, and she said that God woke her up, and she said, go, go check on your son, and she did, and she found him laying in the crib. He was purple and blue. He was having a seizure, and he was aspirating on his vomit. Uh, it was only a miracle that he survived that night, and I said, God, 
Why me? I started working for waste management on the back of a truck, still dealing with the ongoing medical issues with Seth, but also having seizures myself. I began to fall into a great depression. I began to feel that it was all my fault that my family was struggling and that my son had uh, this sickness. I felt like it was, it was me. It's, it's my fault that he's sick. It's my fault that I brought him into this world and having to deal with this and had to suffer through it all. And I wasn't even healthy enough to provide for my family. So I began to fantasize about dying and I began to think of different ways I could end it all. But at the same time, still trying to stay faithful to God and being involved with ministry. But I remember one day I, I was hanging on the back of the truck and the garbage truck. And I said, you know what? If I, if I fall off the truck and I get hit by another car or a truck or whatever, I said, I can make it look like an accident. I can get by and make it on an accident. So my, at least my family could be taken care of financially. Because at the time, my insurance policy with the company was, you know, quite a bit. So I was just thinking in that sense. But I know God. I said, like, I know that he wouldn't let me die. I said, like, I'll be stuck in a bed somewhere with a feeding tube and, <laughs> and whatever. So I'm like, you know what, God, I'm going to continue to trust in you. The Bible says in First Peter 5, 6, and 7, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him. For he careth for you. A year or so after the, all of this, my sister, 38 years young, was diagnosed with a rare blood disease called cystocytosis that a lot of Asian women um, get. And uh, in April 2005, she passed away, leaving a husband and a four-year-old daughter. 38 years old. Uh, she lived in Long Beach. Literally one year, we, we had to go out to California for the funeral. Uh, we brought our kids to go to see her um, before that. But uh, not even a week after we got back from her funeral, my son, Seth, he ended up having a, a seizure. And the seizure lasted for over two hours. The seizure lasted so long that they gave him all the drugs they were legally allowed to give him. Cause it, and they were afraid they were going to cause damage and possibly he could die from it. Uh, so they intubated him. And he was in the hospital for over two weeks. And they said, and we actually had to teach him how to speak again and how to do, how to count, how to do ABCs and all that kind of stuff. We had to do that all over again after that. But it was, yeah, literally one week after my sister died, funeral, boom, right, right with this. And um, so my wife and I, we were probably out of work probably for a good month. And looking back, I don't even remember how we even made it financially. I, I don't even... I, can't, I don't even remember, but, but God, but I know God was there. Uh, at this time, we were heavily involved with ministry in the church attending, uh, that we were attending. And I remember after all this died down a little bit, I, I told God, I said, it seems like every time that we get closer to doing something for you, that we get involved with ministry, I said, God, something happens bad. It's not like a little thing, but something bad and drastic happens to a family member. And I was like, look, I can't deal with this anymore. And so I stepped down for it. We, we, my wife and I, we stepped down for everything. He said, look, I'll be faithful to come into church. I'll be faithful to, to, to your house. And I said, I'll be faithful, with, you know, walking with you. I said, but God, I can't, I can't do that. It's because it seems like every time we take that step of faith, something really bad happens. Don't ever do that, by the way. That was probably the biggest mistake I ever, that's one of the biggest regrets of my life. So if God's calling on you, and he's pulling you to do something for him, for his glory. Step out of faith and do it, is what I ask. Whether what happens or what's going on, God will always make the provision. God will always take care. And the Bible says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him. I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices and my song, I will praise him. So he will, if as long as you go to him, he will give you what you need. He will give you the necessary strength and purpose and, and desire to keep moving forward. So one year later, I visited my brother in Pennsylvania for more, a Memorial Day weekend. Now it's 2006. And we had a wonderful time. A week goes by, and we're getting ready for church. And my dad, I got a phone call from my dad. He said, hey, um, you need to get in your car. 
and you needed to go down to Pennsylvania to see your brother. And I was like, well, we just saw him last week. What's going on? Like, why do I need to go see him? He's like, you need to say goodbye to your brother. I'm like, say goodbye? What are you talking about? Where are you going? You going on a trip? He's like, he's not going to make it. Uh, he was actually a music minister for a church down in Pennsylvania, and he had a stroke in the middle of worship service. And um, my dad said, he's not going to make it through the night. Uh, and he was only 32. 32 years old. So I got off the phone with my dad and I said, God, I said, you just took my sister last year. I said, now you want to take my brother too? I took the phone, I threw it against the wall. I said, I don't understand what's going on. Why is this happening to us? Why are you putting us through this? And my wife, she actually, Jay at the time, he was going to the same church with us. My wife called him, let him know what, what was going on, what was happening. And um, he called David Patton to let him know. And Patton called me, and I don't know if, if you met Patton, but he's a very straightforward, tell you like it is type of guy. Very honest and, and just straightforward with you. And he, he, he talked to me and he said, hey, I'm sorry to hear about your brother. I'm sorry about what's going on. He's like, but don't you know who your God is? Like, don't you know who you serve? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, don't you know who you serve, who your God is? And so he was like, well, what are you doing? He's like, why aren't you worshiping God right now? And so I got off the phone with him. No emotion, no feeling, no nothing. I was like, you know what, God, I, I know this is the right thing to do. So I begin to dance and I begin to worship in my, in my house. And I said, God, I worship you. God, no matter what happens, Lord, no matter what, what goes on, God, you are my God. And I worship you and I praise you right now. And I begin to worship him. And I felt nothing. I felt absolutely nothing. I said, God, I'm all, I said, I'm angry with you. I'm mad at you. I said, but I do this out of obedience because your word tells me to worship you in spirit and truth and it tells me to worship. He doesn't tell you how or when I feel to like to worship, but he just says that you are worthy of my worship. And so um, that being said, we, we went, we went, we got our stuff ready and we left and we went to go down to say goodbye to our brother. When we got there, he was still alive. He was still breathing, uh, and to this day, he's still he's still kicking. He's still he's still going at it. Um, he's not working. He's at, you know he stays at home. His wife does pretty much everything. He he has seizures now too, uh, because of the stroke. Um, but he's alive and he and he serves God still. Uh, just I'm not saying that what I did was was what caused him to 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 be healed or whatever or you know to to pull through. But I believe it was a part of it. In Psalms 18, 6, it says, In my distress, I called upon the Lord, and I cried and called my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and he came before me, even to his ears. So in 2008, we decided to move to Virginia because of my dad's health uh, not doing well. Um, so we went down there. 2010, uh, my dad got diagnosed with lung cancer um, in, in July or in October. He passed in January 2011, 63 years old. So I'm like, okay. At this point, I'm like, okay, whatever, God. <laughs> At this point, I'm like, okay. I, I, don't, I, I don't really understand what's going on. I said, but I'm just going to trust in you. Not even a year later, my wife and kids were up here visiting family. And um, I was working for at and My mom asked me, she was like, hey, can you stay the night at, at my house? And I was like, well, I'm already at home. You're a half hour away. I'll stay there tomorrow night. Well, I have another brother. His name is Bun. And he was staying with her at the time because when my dad passed, he ended up staying there. I got a phone call early in the morning from, my, 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 uh, from Jessica and the local hospital there said that my brother Bun had an asthma attack. Now, normally he's had several asthma attacks and he's been rushed to hospital, so I didn't think nothing of it. I didn't rush. I didn't. I was like, oh, I'll go see him on, on my lunch break because it was right down the street from where I worked. When I got there, I noticed I was I thought he was sleeping, um, but a, apparently he had an asthma attack in the middle of the night. He didn't want to wake up my mom, so he tried to drive himself to the hospital. He made it to the local fire station because they knew because of his situation and who he was, so they worked immediately. But unfortunately, he he uh, was not breathing for a good forty five minutes. Uh, they had to resuscitate him like three or four times. Um, forty four years old. Five days later, he passed away. So,
He left two teenage kids without a father. And again, I asked, I said, God, why me? Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be separate from us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, no matter what happens. And I'll try to be quick. I know we're getting late here. Oh, but I feel this is important. Uh, in 2014, um, I, I decided to go venture out and, 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 and be an entrepreneur and, and stuff and, and just got really tight, really tough. Uh, only made a negative $500 that year from my business and what I was doing. I was the only one working. So um, I prayed and I said, God, I said, what's going on? I'm, I'm doing this because you told me to step out in, in, in faith. And people were coming from the mortgage company. They were taking pictures of a house. They were sending us letters saying, hey, you're going to lose your house. You're not going not gonna to have your house for very long. Um, they were um, serving papers to me, but on a weekly basis saying, hey, you need to pay us or we're taking your house. And um, somehow I just... I continued to, to trust in God. God spoke to me. He said, I gave you that house. I bless you with the house. No one's going to take it from you. No one's going to be able to take it but me. He said, you keep serving me and I, I will bless you. And during this time of, uh, in 2014, I had really no income. Uh, my pastor at the time paid my mortgage twice. He paid a few bills. A lady came up to me in church one day and said, here, God told me to give you this check. It was a check for two grand. Um, God, why me? Why are you so good to me? He, and he, I remember one night I, I prayed to God. I said, God, why am I dealing with all this? Why are we going through all this? This and this and that. He said, do you have a place to put your head at night? I said, yeah. He said, do you eat every day? And I was like, yeah. He said, then what the problem is? He said, I heard him say it just like that. He said, what the problem is? What's the problem? He said, I'm providing everything that you need. I'm giving you all the things that you need to be taken care of and to be alive. He said, why are you, why are you fighting me? Why are you not trusting me? You know, I had to repent. And... So the baseline for, for us, for, for our normal, going through all of these things, was Seth having seizures every couple of weeks being hospitalized at least a few days at a time, at least twice a year. Uh, and he was starting to become behavioral and then occasionally have seizures. Uh, so in 2018, or between 2018 and 2020, he became uh, very, very, the autism kicked in high gear, big time autism. Swearing, yelling, he would pick up, he would literally pick up anything and just start chucking at you, chucking it at you if he was mad and upset. He was always wanting these games on his iPad, and if we'd said no, or he had to wait, he'd just flip out, just go nuts. It got to the point where we were restraining him almost every day, and we had to, you know, keep him safe. And he was a strong kid, um, and so it would take me, my wife, and sometimes Caleb to to, to hold him down and, and to keep him safe, what have you. I remember one night uh, he was flipping out. My wife was had to adjust, and he got up and he bit her right on the hip, and blood just dripping down her leg. Right after that, he went to go see his brother in his room. He walked by a. Uh, uh, a grandfather clock, put his hand right through it, sliced his arm open. Uh, a few days later, he chased me down the street with the uh, with the metal spoon. He said, "I want you to die, 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 die! I don't love you and this and that." Just freaking out. And we live in a semi hood, so it was kind of normal. <laughs> so, so, they, so no cops were called. So <laughs> they're like, "Oh, it's just the Dosh is acting up again." That's the norm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the norm. Um, so. But he was just going, to, and, and I, I got to the point where I was like, God, like, I, I'm done. Like, and, and I called my wife that day when he chased me down the street, and she, um, she was at church, actually, with Caleb. So she came home, and uh, she said, go to church. She said, go, go just go. And, and so I went. I was in a, a white T-shirt, pair of jeans, I think flip-flops. I went to church. They were right at the altar call. I went right up to the altar, and I just broke down, and I said, God, you got to do something. Something's got to happen. And it got to the point uh, about a year or so ago, you know, he did give us the peace and everything. And then at that point is when we started contemplating on moving back here. Uh, and so, because um, her whole family's from up here, the, the healthcare system is way better up here. Uh, we don't, I didn't have any family down there because they're all dead. 
Um, I, I don't mean to sound so, so, so brash, but that's just how I think sometimes because I just, it is what it is. It is what I, you know. Um, but yeah, I did, did, you know, all my family's gone. Uh, so it didn't have any support down there and all our supports up here. So we decided to take the step and then me and Seth came in 2021 and then she just came uh, back in July. But uh, ever since we've been up here though, Seth is, is, it was tough at the beginning <laughs> But he's definitely mellowed out way more. I, I, I think the last time I had to restrain him was like two years ago when, when it was almost every day. Um, he hasn't had a seizure since uh, December of 21. Again, he was having them every couple of weeks. Um, I think that with, with, him, with the comfort level of him being back home, because he, he loves it up here, loves his grandparents. And so I think that had a lot to do with, uh, with him settling down. And then also, you know, with the doctors and everything. So that being said, um, last year, this is my last story and I'm, and I'm done. Uh, when I started working for, for Electric Boat, I was working for Aflac at the time. And I, Jay Pastor and, and Mike kept telling me, like, go, go apply for EB. Go to EB. Go to EB. And I'm like, or Electric Boat, if you don't know what that is. Uh, electric Boat. And I was like, well, I don't do that kind of stuff. I'm not technical. I, I don't know how to do any of that. And I don't have any skills. And they're like, just do it. Just do it. And so I just applied just to shut up Mike. I'm like, all right, I'm just going to do it so you could see that they're not going to accept me. So I, I put it in the application. And um, they gave me a call and, and uh, emailed me and said, hey, we want to do an interview. I'm like, okay. So they'll see after an interview that I'm not a good fit. So... <laughs> So I told, I, I told him in the interview, I was like, I have no technical, you usually don't do this when in the interview, you don't tell them your weaknesses. And I was like, yeah, I'm not technical. I don't know how to do it because I was just trying to really get out of it. I didn't want the job really. And he was like, they were like, oh, oh, that's okay. We'll teach you. We'll show you how. And, and then at the end of the interview, she was like, this was the best interview that I had. I'm like, really? man, I would hate to see the bad ones. <laughs> Uh, and she, at the end of the, the, the conversation, she offered me a job. So I'm a type of person, I'm going to walk through the doors. If they're open, and if I feel like this is a, a God thing, I'm going to continue to walk, and I'm going to, and I'm going to at least try. Uh, so anyways, um, they set up a, a, a medical screening, and they found out that, that my blood sugar was 200, 265. And they said, hey, you're diabetic. I, I knew I was diabetic, but I didn't really pay any attention to it. Um, didn't really care about it. And they're like, it's high. We need to see what your A1C is. And I didn't have a doctor at the time. So I went to CVS and, and the lady looked at me and she took my A1C. She looked at me. She said, out of all the times you've been to the ER, she's like, how's it been? I'm like, what is it like? I was like, I've never been to the ER. She's like, really? I was like, yeah, I've never been. And uh, I was like, I get headaches. She's like, that's it? I said, that's all you get is headaches. I said, yeah. My A1C, if you guys are familiar with A1C, my, my A1C was 11.5. 11.5. I set up an appointment with the doctor in Virginia, and I went to go talk to him. He asked me the same question, and I gave him the same answer. Yeah, you know, I just get headaches. Well, he told me, he said, with the number of where it's at, and my, my pastor's wife down there, um, she's diabetic. And she's like, Willie, she's like, do you understand that, that you should be dead right now? I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, whenever I have, whenever my level is at nine, she's like, I have seizures, I black out, I, I go to the hospital for days at a time. I'm like, really? I was like, all I got is headaches. <laughs> and um, so the doctor told me, he was like, with your number being that high, he's like, you are acceptable, high risk for stroke, heart attack, hypertension, liver, liver failure, kidney failure. And he's like, he looked at me, he said, you're lucky you're alive. Is it because I actually met someone online, uh, you know, with one of those groups on Facebook when he was like a seven something or a seven or eight, he, his foot got taken off. I'm like, and I was like, so for me, what that was, was God just showing me and opening up my eyes. And he said, and, and he, these guys, uh, Jay and Mike, you know, they, they saved my life. Is it because now my eyes are open and I'm seeing and God showed me and said, hey, look, you got to take care of yourself. You got to take care. So now my A1C, well, the last time I checked was like a seven. So it went from 11 to seven. So I know I'm not where I need to be, but I'm getting there. <laughs> I like I, I like cookies and stuff. <laughs> um, 
But but I believe that God opened the door for that job, not because for the job itself, but because, but to save my life. Because I, I think I was going to a bad place. And, um, in Psalms 107, 1 and 2, it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemer of the Lord say so. And he redeemeth the hand of the enemy. I want to end with this real quick. Or I'm going to say this and I'm going to end with the poem. Every situation I describe, because a lot of times you look at this, you're like, well, after all this, like, why would I want to live for God? <laughs> like, like, why would I want to do that? Why would, you, why would that be encouraging to me to live for God if you're going to have to deal with all that? Um, but every situation I describe, the Lord made a way out. He made provision. He was always my rock. He was always my refuge. He always provided the answers. He always provided me with wisdom. Uh, maybe not one we're looking for. Maybe it wasn't something we're looking for, but it was something that we needed or something that I needed in my life. Uh, he knows what we're going to be and what we go through. And God is so worthy of our praise. Um, so with this poem, I'm going to end with the poem. Father God, I love you so. You care for me even when I don't know. I often question your intent despite those promises you've already kept. I try to make sense of all around, yet my eyes focus narrowly on my own. You forgive my impatience and my self-righteous thoughts and securely and secured my salvation through your death on the cross. You redeemed all my sins and gave me new life, an act that cost a most precious price. With your help, dear Lord, I will trust in the perfect plan that is a gift from your, from your great hand. Thank you for each day's new mercy and grace that wipes away all my iniquities. To you, Adonai, is my praise for always. May my last breath be whispered, giving you all the glory. So maybe you've come this morning and you're just trying to figure it out. And you're just trying to understand, God, why me? Why do I have to go through this? So let me of what I spoke this morning. Let, let that be my story, be an encouragement to you. That it's going to be okay. That it's going to be all right. The Bible says he, he worked, all things work together for the good of the, of the people that, that love God. And if we're willing to seek him, we're willing to pursue him, we're willing to be obedient to his voice and to his word, he's going to work it out. No matter how hard and how tough it may get, God is here for you. He's wanting to heal you. You want to put something on for me? Why don't we Why don't we stand together this morning and gather around the altar if that's okay? And maybe you're dealing with those situations and and you're God, why me? Why am I having to deal with all this? God, I'm trying to to figure out life. I'm trying to to be obedient to you. I'm trying to 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 serve you, God, but it, it just seems so hard, Lord. It seems so difficult. Every time I try to make things right, every time I try to go this route, Lord, everything seems to fall apart. So this morning, why don't we just pray for just a few moments? Why don't we just see God for a moment? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Lord, you're worthy, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, I can't make this life on my own, God. I made it through this life because you were there, Lord. Because you've been a part of my life, God. Because of your, your encouragement. Because of your strength, God. Because of your peace, Lord. Because of your will, God. I've been able to make it through this life, Lord. There's no way I would have been able to face this life and the things that we've gone through, Lord, without you there, God, holding our hand, without healing us, God, without providing for us, Lord, without giving us the answers. Hallelujah. This altar is open this morning. If you need encouragement this morning, come to the front this morning. God is here. He's willing to, to minister to you this morning. He's willing to give you the strength that you need. He's willing to give you the answers that you've been looking for. He's willing to give you the encouragement that you've been seeking. But you have to seek Him first. The Bible even says it. He said, draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. But He's waiting for you to make the first step. He's waiting for you to take that first step of faith. 
and believing that he will be there for you, believing that he's going to come through for you, that he's going to bring restoration, that he's going to bring healing, that he's going to bring deliverance. God is here this morning. He's willing to move in your life, but you got to be willing to trust him. Yes, things may be chaos. Yes, my family might be dying. My father might be dead. My, my mother might be dying. My, 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 my spouse is leaving me. They, they don't care about what I do. But you got a God that cares for you. You got a God that's wanting to reach out to you this morning, but he's waiting for you to take the first step. So this morning, if you have a need in your life, if you're dealing with struggle, make your way to the front this morning and we'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. We'll battle with you this morning. We'll go in the trenches with you this morning. Lord, we ask you, God, that you begin to minister to your people, God. That you bring healing to us, God. Bring healing to our minds, oh Lord. You help us, God, with the things of life, God, the struggles of life, God. Help us, Lord, to trust in your word, to believe in your word, to stand firmly on your word, God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The Bible says in 4, Philippians 4 and 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. If you have a request this morning, let it be known unto Him. Let it be known unto Him this morning. Let God know, that, God, I'm angry with you. God, I don't understand why I got to go through this, but Lord, I'm going to trust you anyways. I'm going to believe in your word anyways, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. You're worthy. You're worthy, God. Minister God, bring that anointing in this place this morning. Bring your power, God, in this place this morning, God. Bring healing, God, in your house this morning, Jesus. Lord, we worship you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we magnify you, God. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy, God, of our worship, Lord. Work, God. You might have been Hallelujah. 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 Church, that's right. Let's, let's keep seeking God this morning. If you feel the pool of God on you, just continue to respond to His Spirit this morning. It's all right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church, thank you so much for coming out this, this morning. Be encouraged. Do mighty and great things for God this week. Uh, those people in your family, those at your work, show God's love and show God's favor this week. In the mighty name of Jesus, you guys are dismissed.